Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, the Sandex webinar Futurum Careers, helping teachers inspire the next generation of STEM and STEAM experts. I am Eleni Mirciotti and I coordinate the online training activities for Sandex. Today we have with us my colleague Ekaterina Sastitko, who is supporting this webinar. If you experience technical issues, please leave us a message in the Q&A box. Today we have we have with us Karen Lindsay, the director and co-founder of Future Futurum Careers, and Erica Morgan, assistant director and former English teacher, as well as Brett Langerberg, director and co-founder. Futurum Careers is a science communication agency working with teachers, researchers, academia, and STEM experts in order to create and disseminate high quality educational materials for students and raise awareness about STEM career paths. Erica, Karen, and Brett, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eleni. Um, thank you for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, before I start, I'd just like to say a few things. The first thing is that um, I am reading from notes. That's so that um, I don't lose track. I tend to go off a little bit, so I, I'm reading from notes. Um, we also can't guarantee that dogs or children won't interrupt us at any point, so I apologise for that in advance. Um, and also the the slides itself, they are there is a slight delay, so I just want to warn you about that. But hopefully this will um, work as smoothly as it can. Right. So my name is uh, Karen Lindsay. I'm director and co-founder of Future and Careers. I set up the STEAM education platform with Brett Langenberg, who you can see there. Um, he will be joining us for the Q&A. Brett and I have worked um, together in science communication for over eight years, uh, working with academics all over the world to communicate their research to policymakers and the general public. We set up Futurum two years ago. In fact, it was two years exactly because it was in um, October 2018. Uh, my background is in communications, but um, I've also trained as a secondary school teacher and I taught French and German to secondary school and college students. I also taught English as a, a foreign language um, to university students in China. So, a future is a, it mirrors my career path because um, its aim is to connect real world research projects, that STEAM projects that are being worked on right now with students all over the world. Erica, you can see in the middle and also at the bottom there. Um, she's the assistant editor at Future and Careers. Erica jo joined us earlier this year um, and has 17 years teaching experience in secondary schools in the UK and abroad. Uh, she ha also has experience working with uh, senior leadership teams. Erica is helping us make Future and Careers even more accessible and useful to teachers. So. Okay. the agenda for today. Um, I'll explain what Future and Careers is, um, what our aims are and why we're passionate about what we do um, in STEM and STEAM education. Um, I'll then hand over to Erica who will talk about how we help teachers uh, deliver a learning and teaching experience that extends beyond the classroom and then this will be followed by a Q&A. Right, what is Future and Careers? Well, essentially, it's a free teaching resource for use in schools and at home. We work with academics all over the world and translate their research into free education resources that can be used in classrooms and at home. Our resources complement all school subjects relating to STEAM, so that's science, technology, engineering, arts, maths and medicine. And our ultimate aim is to help students connect the students, they, uh, the subjects, sorry, the subjects they're learning at school with real world careers. We have a website and a magazine. The magazine, which you'll see on the left, is published every quarter. It's free to download and it contains a snapshot of our latest research articles or stories, we like to call them. The website on the right is updated with new uh, materials every week. You'll find research articles and their accompanying activity sheets. We have articles from partner and associate organisations um, that offer edu educational resources and CPD for teachers. We have a weekly blog that tackles a range of issues 
such as mental health, STEM competitions, links to international days of celebration, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we want, um, we want future careers to be accessible to everyone, regardless of their gender, race or economic background, which is why everything we create is available to download for free on our website, uh, Scientix, TES, Teachers Pay Teachers and the European Geoscience Geosciences Union. Futurum Careers is aimed at 14 to 19 year olds um, and it's essentially a career guidance tool that offers students tangible experiences of what it's like to be an engineer or a mathematician or a biologist, for example. And used in an educational context, our resources support countries' national priorities for developing the next generation of STEAM experts. In the UK, Ofsted now ranks schools according to their application of Gatsby benchmarks. Gatsby benchmarks are a framework of eight guidelines that define the best careers provision in schools and colleges. When schools and teachers use our content, we can support them in meeting Gatsby's benchmarks too. So that's learning from career and labour market information. Uh, four, linking curriculum learning to careers. Five, encounters with employers and employees. And finally, seven, encounters with further and higher education. Uh, the US equivalent for these standards or these benchmarks, sorry, are um, the NGSS, which stands for Next Generation Science Standards. Erica will go into more detail about how our resources are designed to support teachers. Um, but right now I would like to talk about why we set up Future and Careers and why we believe or we feel that it's not just another free resource. We hope to achieve a lot through Future and Careers. Uh, we, want to, we want to offer teenagers and young adults um, the knowledge and confidence to study STEAM subjects and in turn social mobility. We want to help scientists and researchers communicate their, um, their work to a global audience of teenagers, young adults and teachers. And we want to help teachers deliver a learning and teaching experience that extends beyond the classroom. So that's providing educators with appropriate resources to inspire the next generation. So let's talk about um, giving teenagers and young adults the knowledge and confidence to study STEAM, STEAM subjects and therefore social mobility. Um, I think it helps to think of this in the context of science capital. Now, the term science capital was first coined in 2014 by Louise Archers and her colleagues working on what is known as the Aspires Project at King's College London. The project is now in its third phase and it has moved to the University College London. These researchers liken the concept of science capital to a bag, uh, which contains all the science related knowledge, attitudes, experiences and resources a person has acquired over their lifetime. To quote from their website, it includes the science you know, how you think about science, so that's your attitudes, your, your disposition towards science, do you enjoy it? It's also about who you know, for example, do you know anyone working in the sciences? Are your parents very interested in science? And then finally, it's also about the sort of everyday engagement you have with science. Are the children reading science books at home? Are they um, watching science programmes on television? The Aspires team has found that the more science capital young people have, the more likely they are to study science in the future. Worryingly, a recent survey by this team of 3,658 young people found that only 5% had high levels of science capital. Is this really a problem? Well, in terms of social mobility, it might be. Like I said, our aim is to help students and teachers help students connect the subjects they're learning with real world careers in STEAM. Um, jobs in this area are well paid, they're generally more secure, they're hugely rewarding 
which means any student that engages with STEM and STEAM subjects increases their employability and social mobility. Right, now back to our second aim, which is helping scientists and researchers communicate their work. Why is this important? I think the current coronavirus pandemic is a good topic to start with here. Uh, if COVID has taught us anything, it's that science communication is vital. The problem is, if citizens are lacking in science literacy, then all the best science communication strategies in the world won't achieve the public engagement that they seek. I'd like to play you a short clip from Anthony Fauci. He is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He was recently interviewed by the US Department of Health and Human Services, and they were discussing the issue of trust and the North American public's reaction to advice given them to them by public health officials for dealing with COVID-19. I hope you can hear this. You might not be able to hear the clip, so I'll just give you a, a few seconds or minutes, sorry, to read the quote there from Anthony. So basically, Fauci is describing an anti-science and anti-authority phenomenon where people aren't believing the science, they don't believe authority. And he describes it as a North American problem. It is, of course, a global problem. But let's take the anti-vaccination movement, for example, uh, which appears to be fueling a, an increase in vaccine hesitancy worldwide. In a paper published in the European Journal of Public Health early last year, um, which examined the link between political populism and vaccine hesitancy, the authors concluded that both were driven by a similar dynamic, and that was a profound distrust in elites and experts. So the question we need to be asking ourselves is whether this anti-science, anti-authority phenomenon has anything to do with STEM and STEAM education? Well, in an attempt to answer this question, I'd like to put you in direction of a report which was recently published by the UK government. It's called Public Attitudes to Science. And similar to the Aspires team, it describes science capital as a measure of someone's engagement or relationship with science, how much they value it, and whether they feel it is connected with their life. For this report, people were asked what came to mind when they thought about science. 24% of people interviewed in this report came up with specific categories of science. For example, biology, chemistry or physics. And 12% said school was the thing that came to mind when thinking about science. And um, when we dig deeper, it turns out that those who associate science with school feel that they're not well informed about science. 74% said this, and 33% say that science is just not for them. If I quote from the report, this potentially suggests that for these people, school was their last point of real engagement with science. Now, I want to emphasize that the, that most people that, that the fact that people are equating science with school is testament to the amazing work of science teachers. However, knowledge and experience of science shouldn't end once people leave school. Science is always there. It's a, it has a continual impact on our lives. So our learning and appreciation of it should also be continual. Um, it's for these reasons and perhaps many more that the team um, here at Future and Careers is passionate about STEAM education. And I'd um, like to sort of talk a bit of a, on a bit more of a personal note about why I'm personally passionate about this. When, um, when I was at school, uh, the careers advice I received was pretty patchy. Uh, my parents left school at quite a young age. Um, and so they were unaware of all the opportunities that might be open to me and my sisters and my brother. Uh, 
I absolutely loved chemistry and geography, um, but I was pushed towards the arts, mainly because this was the interest of my parents and I was good at it too. Um, but there, but also on top of that, there were timetable clashes, which meant it was impossible for me to study both the arts and the sciences. I had to choose one or the other. As a young girl in the 1980s and 90s, um, it didn't feel as if there were any uh, female role models working in the sciences for me to aspire to. So when it came to choosing GCSEs and A-levels, I was basically basing my choices on misconceptions and lack of knowledge. Now, this is my experience of um, careers guidance or lack of it. Um, thankfully, it has come a long, long way over the years and much has improved. But that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities for Im improvement. To effectively raise science capital for everyone, that's regardless of age, gender or ethnicity, we want to help students make the connection between the core STEM subjects they are learning and the latest innovations and scientific discoveries. Rather than being portrayed as inaccessibly intelligent or geeky, white and male, as is so often the case in films and on TV, scientists of all genders and ethnicities should be portrayed to students as accessible role models and mentors. On the right, there we go, you'll see real pictures of real scientists that we have worked with. They're not always in a lab coat. They don't always work alone. They're real people like you and me who are passionate about what they do. Also, the link between STEM subjects and the arts, social sciences, humanities, should also be emphasised, as well as the need for so-called soft skills in the sciences. I mean, how many students realise that curiosity, teamwork, creativity and the ability to communicate are, are needed in the sciences? And not only that, these are attributes that resonate with girls in particular. For example, there's the WISE campaign in the UK um, who we've worked with and it campaigns for gender balance in science, tech and engineering. It conducted a study a few years back which found that much of the language we use in the sciences and STEM tends to put girls and young women off because it doesn't speak to them directly. But words like communication, creativity, um, teamwork, all of these words do. Um, I'm about to finish my part of the presentation now, but I want to emphasise that um, teachers are doing a fantastic job teaching our children. Uh, those of us that struggle with homeschooling over the, this COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm, I'm one of those, um, we'll certainly recognise this. So our ultimate aim is to help te teachers fill their students' bag, students' bag with the myriad wonders of science, STEM and STEAM. I'll now hand you over to Erica, who will talk about how future and careers can be used in classrooms or at home. OK, thank you very much, Karen. Um, so as Karen said, the key thing I'm going to talk about is how we can help teachers. And that's really important because we want to emphasise that we're not telling teachers how to do their job. We know that you are the experts, but hopefully, and we think so, we've got some resources that will make your teaching easier and more productive. So. Just bear with the PowerPoint. Well, that's funny. Just as we were talking about teaching and my next slide is about how difficult it can be. The screen has frozen. I'll see if it comes up in a moment. So what I was saying in the in the first slide is that um, even though I, wa I wasn't teaching six months ago, um, I'm out of the classroom now. But when I first had to think about what it is that we could do to motivate people, um, my first thought, funnily enough, ah, there we go. My first thought was about all the things that make it really hard to motivate students. So um, instantly with my old teacher's head on, I was thinking about the time and the lack of that we have. The, there are always budget constraints, always money to think about if you want to buy new resources. 
We have an in-depth curriculum we all need to follow. We've got to prepare our students for exams and assessments. Along the way, we really need to try and stretch and challenge them. Um, we need to progress. We need to show they're progressing. We need to provide evidence of progressing. Um, we're told we also need to try and take our subject beyond the classroom. Of course, at the moment, teachers are also coping with social distancing, and that goes as something as simple as cleaning desks after the kids leave the room. Alongside this, teachers are still trying to improve their CPD. And of course, all the other pressures and expectations from the day to day, such as helping somebody find a pen or dealing with bullying. So that was my first initial thought about why sometimes it's really hard to do what you think is the best you can do because so much is going on. Hence the photo of an exhausted looking teacher. However, um, when I then thought about our resources, I thought about how actually it hit so many of those problem areas um, and what I'm hoping today is you'll see something in our resources that will help you to tackle maybe some things you do find difficult but also um, you know give you opportunity to do things you didn't know you could do. So as Karen has said our resources are free that's really important um, you don't have to worry about budgets they are there for you to use. Secondly, they are online and that's really, really important for several reasons, I think. I know having a resource that looks good on the whiteboard at the front of the room is really useful, but actually it's useful to be able to disseminate um, information through Google Classroom or class charts. So that means resources can be used for homework, they can be used for absenteeism, they can be used when schools are shut down or kids are being sent home with social distancing and there's a record there of what is going on. So the online accessibility is really, really important. Um, when I come to talk through the resources shortly, you'll see that they are categorised into subject areas because we know that's obviously really important. You have got to be showing you're focusing on the curriculum. However, because our resources are about what real researchers are doing in the real world, um, it is about going beyond exams and it is about taking the subject beyond the classroom. Um, in the UK at the moment, the thinking from Ofsted is that actually if you teach very, very, very well, um, automatically they will be prepared for the exams and that actually we should be thinking at a broader scope. Sometimes that's easier said than done and that's the thinking. Um, this pressure that to stretch and challenge students, and it's a pressure that we put on ourselves that we want to do, um, I think is met by our resources because we are seeing researchers talking about work when they are at the top of their game. They are the experts in this field and they have dedicated their lives to subjects. So they're definitely, um, definitely people that will enable our students to sort of challenge themselves. A little bit later on, I'm going to talk about Bloom's taxonomy and how we use that for activity sheet. Um, I hope you'll see that our resources do encourage um, independent learning. And I think this is really important. The next bullet point where often we think about progress. Actually, it's very easy to think about progress for progress sake. But I like the idea of young people looking at experts in the field and seeing actually where progress can lead. And of course, that means they're able to meet these experts albeit at a distance, but at the moment in a socially distanced world, field trips, visitors into school, that's not going to happen anyway. Um, and I think the most important thing is the aspirational element to our resources. Um, and because lots of researchers out there are working on, you know, applications that are going to impact our world, it really does open opportunity for debate and many, many PSHE topics. Um, and hopefully you'll see some of that when I go through some of the resources. So um, firstly, I just wanted to give you an overview of the type of subjects our resources have covered. And these are just the ones we've had in the last few months. I hope your first impression is they do look bright and they do look vivid. They're supposed to be very stimulating and engaging. But I just want to talk about the breadth of topics. Um, and you've got to bear in mind, this is somebody I'm coming from an English teacher, English teacher perspective. So I think if I'm wowed by these STEAM topics, um, I think any student will be. So here we've got machine learning on the left. We've got plant science on the right. Astronomy, humanitarian engineering, marine ecology. Um, uh, Alan Goddard looking at replacements of fossil fuels. We've got um, astro uh, aerospace and astro engineering, looking at wind turbines, maths and physics. 
Um, that was a really interesting article on the left about technopolitics and how that's um, how geographers are exploring that. Um, and then this article on the right was a chemical engineer looking at climate change. So I hope you can see there's a real broad range of really up to date topics. And the screenshot in front of you now is from our website and you can see it broken down into different categories, which is obviously important because you need to know that these do connect to the curriculum areas such as humanities or engineering or physics. Um, but I also think it's really important to students to know that one topic or one classroom area can open up to many, many different areas. So, for example, the articles in front of you all connect to the category of physics and maths and chemistry. OK, there you go. Um, but it's really interesting because you've got there, for example, an article from a, a food scientist who's looking at the science between behind a, a perfect cup of coffee. And then you've got Laxmi who's working on chromosomes. Um, and I think just that is a really good reminder that students might often think that one subject, if you're a, if you're in a physics class, that's going to lend itself to being a physicist. Um, but actually, there are lots of different pathways and that's something the researchers always communicate. So our resources themselves usually come in three sort of sections. So the first section is the main article. So here's an example in front of you of Dr Gronenborn's article. Um, she's a structural biologist and it's recounting some of the most recent research that she has done. Um, but I just want to break down that topic, uh, that page for you a little bit, just to see some really important elements of it. Okay. So we like to include a talk like a section. Um, you can see there then there's some really high level subject terminology to sort of arm students to start talking about a subject in a way that really is quite stretched and challenged um, and actually is using language similar to how Angela would use language. You'll see that we always have a profile of the researcher so they can get to see the person's face, which is really important. They can see where they're based and you'll see that although she's referred to Dr. Gronenborn there, throughout the rest of the article, we refer to Angela um, that usually happens in our articles and that's because one of our key things is we want students to see these highly successful highly intelligent um, academics as being really accessible and I think the more you read about them they actually really really are um, this little box that's just come up is Angela's top tips for students we always like to include that and I think the tips are really nice because on the one hand, sometimes they do give quite practical advice, for example, subjects they think students should follow, but actually more often than not, it's really personal advice, such as Angela said here about creating your own path and don't you don't have to follow in anyone's footsteps. So they're quite nice sort of confidence boosting um, top tips there. And she's also said that there's nothing wrong with failing. Um, and actually, I think that means a lot for um, you know a young student to hear a very successful academic telling you that failure is is going to happen. So that's the main article there. So I'll just so once the student will have read about a researcher's um, project, the next section is the careers guide. So there are a few different sections here I'm just going to talk you through. So firstly, there's generally an overview of the, the sort of field or the discipline. And you'll see in this box, actually, we've come back to Angela and Angela has given some insights about what qualities she thinks are useful in her field, what projects she would like to see in her field. So it gives the student a chance just to think about the broader picture. Um, which is important because they might be involved in the in the broader picture. There's also some sort of very practical information such as universities that the um, that are recommended and courses and you know usually a bit of information about salaries just to give people those kind of you know the everyday practical information they need. But I think this is a really really important section and this is about how the scientists, the researchers themselves got to where they got. So here's Angela talking about what inspired her. 
And I think what's really important about this section is that, yes, they do talk about hard work and they do talk about tenacity, but they often talk about, you know, when they were younger, they liked um, going out and playing with nature. They liked playing with Lego. They liked swim club. They liked reading. And actually, often they do sound just like you and me, um, which I think, again, all comes back to that accessibility and that aspiration. And then lastly, in this careers guide, you can see we've got a little section with there were a couple of researchers there. This is Chris, who worked with Angela. So students can get to see a little bit about the sort of the working groups that the researchers have. Collaborate, collaboration and relationships are really important. And I think it's important for students to see that. Just going back to what Karen said about, you know, gone are the days of the, the solitary scientist in his lab actually you'll have men and women all working together. Um, here's another example of a careers guide and I just wanted to show you this one because we do often try and incorporate students into the articles or um, people at the very very early stages of their careers. So in this article we had Ramil featured um, he worked on this particular project while he was at university but has now gone to work on at IBM I think that's a brilliant thing for students to see, knowing that they could already start working on an exciting project at university. And here's somebody who's obviously going on and doing very well in his career already. Uh, but Brianna, she's still at the university studying biology. And there is Pedro, who's also still at university studying maths. So I think it's really important for young people to see other young people looking very happy as they do there, very proud of their achievements in different fields, but working together. Um, and I think that's an important message, even if someone isn't going to follow them into that particular field. So once we've had the article and the careers guide, the next section is the activity sheet. You'll see on the left hand side, we always have the talking points. And I'm just going to come back to that in a moment. Um, but on the right hand side, you'll see there are more resources and activities you can do at home or in the classroom. So on the right hand side, you'll see that there are some machine learning apps recommended so you can follow in the footsteps of Dr Friedland. Um, and on the left hand side, lots of links to find out more about this very exciting expedition that um, Dr Edgecombe went on. So there's always quite a lot of variety there, depending really on the research that's covered. But I do just want to talk about the, the talking points because it's something we think is really, really important. Um, I hope you can see on the left hand side, using Bloom's taxonomy, the questions always start off at those lower levels of knowledge and comprehension, partly because, you know, as teachers, you need to know that the basics have been understood, that the students can retrieve that information. But also that's particularly useful as well if you've set this as homework and you want them to reflect on what they've learned or they've read it for home and you want to come, them to come back and tell you what they've learned. But as the questions go on, they do get more complex and the aim is that it prompts deeper learning and deeper discussion within your classroom. And the last section is the evaluation section, which I think is really, really important. Um, on the left hand side, so I'll go back so that's not confusing. On the left hand side, you can see for Karina's article, Karina is a marine ecologist. The first question is about actually what did the student get from reading the article? Were they surprised? Has it changed their perception? So straight away with that question, you're, you're proving that they're making progress, progress of thought and their opinion has been changed. And that's a really nice way for you to kind of assess what they've gained from it. Um, the second evaluation question though, is students evaluating themselves actually? Karina suggested some attributes she'd like to see in a scientist. And that question is putting the onus now back on the student thinking what do they think about themselves, their skills, you know, what do they think might be important? Um, and then the questions on the right hand side, this was for David, who's a plant scientist doing some amazing work with, um, with soil. Um, he mentioned some people he, were, he was really inspired by and actually interesting, a scientist that won the Peace Prize. So what an interesting question to get students to think about, should a scientist ever deserve a Peace Prize? Um, and I think that's where that element of PSHE and debate comes in. What does STEAM, what does STEM contribute to society? So really thinking about that bigger picture. Um, 
And the next question, David is highlighting the importance of collaboration and actually getting students to evaluate how good they are at collaborating. They might be sitting in the physics classroom and they might be getting top, 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 top grades, but actually now they're reminded there are other skills that are really, really important. And actually that coming from a very successful researcher is sometimes more powerful than when it comes from a teacher, when students that just think we're saying that to get them to behave. Um, so um, that's there are the three key sections of our resources, but we've also just started to produce these careers PowerPoints. Um, and the aim of these are really, really trying to encourage that evaluation and that reflection a little bit more and to enable our researchers to talk, as it were, more directly with students. So here's April, who works in agricultural science and has done loads of work to sort of tackle inequality in her field. Um, and she's asking questions now to students about how confident they might be in their areas. Um, how, why is she motivated to do what she does? Which resources would help them? And the next example is for careers in volcanology and geology. And this is uh, Professor Stephen South. Um, and his questions, he's asking, you know, which of his tips were most useful? And actually a very simple question such as how would you feel about living abroad for your work? Actually getting students to think a little, about, a little bit about the practicalities of research, that it isn't a nine to five job often, and it is about going out there in the world. And some people might find that really appealing, but some people might honestly think, oh, that's something I need to think about. Um, but you'll see that the, the PowerPoints are obviously there so that they can be there in the classroom and the questions come up gradually one by one because we think it's really important that students have a chance to think about these things individually with friends before they kind of feed back to the class. Or even this could be something that they don't have to feed back to the class at all. It's just for their own reflection. OK, um, so there are our main resources and I hope I'm not going through this too quickly um, but I just wanted to talk about this idea that we think it's really important to keep the conversation going. Um, our resources are there as a starting point and there are lots of links and lots of resources that people can then go on to find but actually this is something that we feature on our, um, our website that we think is really really important that students do have a chance to ask the researchers a question um, and I think that's really important for them to know that their thinking or their communication in this area, their exploration, it doesn't have to end when they finish reading the article. So in this article, Doug, Melissa and Chris were featured and students could comment there and they could ask a question for the researchers to get back to them. And I think I've got a couple of examples where this has happened. Um, so Noah wanted to get some information. He's a grade 12 biology course student. So if I'm right, I think that means he is 16, 17. Um, so obviously thinking very hard about what he's going to do next. So he got in touch. He wanted to talk to um, Sarah Anolti, who's the researcher, uh, and he did. And then he was really kind after he'd he'd talked to her about her bobtail squid research. He wrote a really lovely comment for us saying how it really had increased his understanding of marine biology. Um, super confident he's going to ace the project. Um, and I think it probably goes about saying he's probably going to be just that little bit more engaged in biology because he's talked to somebody um, beyond the classroom. And I'd like to think that would then mean he's going to be super motivated for his class teacher who they can help him to find out more and more. Um, this was an example from one of the activity sheets that enables the conversation to keep going. So um, Alan Goddard, I mentioned him before with his um, research trying to find an alternative to fossil fuels, um, running a citizen science project that is trying to get as much information and as much involvement as possible. It's really important to remember that some scientists can't conduct their research without this kind of contribution from the community. It's a big part of their funding. It's a big part of their work. So in this activity sheet, they wanted people to contact them, to get a kit, to contact them and actually to become involved in the research that the students had just read about. Um, and that could be within the classroom with their teacher or of course it could also be independent. 
Um, and here is Alan Goddard. He's talking about how fantastic the resources were, of course. But what we really like is you'll see there's that little addition where he's really impressive, actually, the reach of his article. And actually, he says that the citizen science project was included and it was picked up as far away as Australia. So that's fantastic for us to see that um, the resources from the article that's got the students interested to the discussions in the classroom that they would have had with their teachers to actually becoming involved and then they've now fed back to the researcher. Um, so just to clarify what Karen was saying about where our resources can be found. Um, Probably most importantly, our website, because it's all there. So please have a look, see what you can find. Have a look at those different subjects areas and see, you know, what's of interest. Um, but actually, I would say even look at articles out of your subject area because you'd be surprised about the collaborate collaboration that is mentioned along the way. Um, our articles are available on TESS, which is main teaching um, resources, um, online resources in, in the UK, um, but also Teachers Pay Teachers, um, which is also a main area for um, America. And um, our European based or European funded research is um, uh, found at Scientix and European Geosciences Union that Karen mentioned, which is obviously for the resources based on geosciences. Um, we also have our Facebook page. Um, you'll see new articles being promoted there, sort of, you know, uh, um, sort of weekly, and as well as lots of other things that are going on. Pinterest is a great area just to see an overview of all the work that is there and some of the people that have been, been involved. And we're also very active on Twitter. So hopefully one of those will be a platform that you'll feel comfortable in sort of having a go at looking at our resources. That takes us to Q&A. Karen, Erika, thank you so much for your presentation and your contribution. Uh, indeed, we have some questions from our participants. Uh, question number one, science is not a religion. It is not a matter of believing in it. It is a matter of being able to understand data and evidence and draw logical conclusions. Am I correct? Thanks, Selene. Uh, thanks, Karen. Thanks, Erica. Wonderful job. Uh, I hope everyone's uh, still engaged and interested in what we're doing. Um, what an interesting question, and I think Tom Cruise would probably disagree with you, uh, but um, I think from our point, yes, science is not a religion, um, and we are not by any means trying to culture belief in science. What we are saying is, we need to instill trust in science. Um, science literacy means uh, that a, a citizen's ability to understand and interrogate information is improved. Um, so it's all about building trust uh, rather than faith. Does that answer the question? We hope so. Okay. Moving on to the second question. The managers and school authorities won't let our students use phones or tablets at school. Can we use STEM resources without using technology in our classrooms? Uh, again, a really interesting question, and I think we'll find uh, from country to country and from region to region as the local resources that teachers have available to them um, will influence their ability to be able to utilize different technologies uh, in the classrooms. Um, this is something that we are very, very conscious of, uh, and it's one of the reasons why uh, you'll find the articles on our website, but also the downloadable versions, the PDFs, uh, are available as well. So that means teachers can download them, can print them off, they can be used as handouts within the classroom, but they can also be uh, saved, for example, to a, a USB or a flash drive. And if a teacher is able to use a projector in the classroom, uh, they can still be projected onto a screen. Um, so there are, I would imagine with a, a, a little bit of creativity, there are a number of ways uh, in which um, technology can be introduced into the classroom. And, and I would suggest in instances 
where you have those kinds of difficulties, it might be a great opportunity to, um, to, to pose that challenge to students as to how they think technology uh, or STEM can be introduced into the classroom without the use of technology, perhaps. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, another question. Where do you find those PowerPoints you just mentioned? I believe they're referring to the PowerPoints that Erika talked about. That is correct, yes. Um, the PowerPoints are a very new product that we have just started developing. Uh, we have two uh, PowerPoints available at the moment which complement uh, articles. Um, and you will find the, the PowerPoints if you go into an individual article within the article library online, on the article landing page, on the right hand side beneath the opening paragraph is where you will find firstly the downloadable version of the article, then a link to the downloadable activity sheet, and if there is a PowerPoint, you will find that link uh, to the downloadable version then beneath the activity sheet. The two articles that currently have PowerPoints, uh, one of them is in the earth and environment space, and that is Professor Stephen Self's article about volcanology and geology. Uh, and the other is in the tech space, uh, and that is all about um, uh, online uh, safety and cybersecurity. Uh, and that's an article uh, that we covered with uh, Professor Xu Jun Li and um, Dr. Jason Nurse. Uh, what we will be doing uh, over the coming weeks um, is adding a section to our resources tab where those PowerPoints will be displayed uh, individually as well in the same way that the activity sheets uh, are shown on the resources uh, page of the website currently. So that is uh, under development um, uh, and in progress uh, at the moment. Thank you very much. We have another question. These resources are really well presented and very attractive. I'm teaching physics for 12 year old students. I'm continuously running out of time teaching the syllabus. There is no coursework and exams is the only way of assessment. How can we apply pressure on governing body? I believe she is talking about the authorities in order to allow for more freedom and space in the classroom. Incidentally, I'm a Sandex ambassador. Gosh. Um, an excellent question uh, and I must be honest, I don't think we are in a position to be able to respond to that kind of question. I think on ongoing pressure from teachers, um, having organizations like ourselves that work in the space, providing um, uh, complementary uh, materials is always going to be useful. Uh, but I think if, if a step change is going to be made, it needs to be driven by educators. Of course, thank you very much. What kind of feedback do you receive from teachers about the mentorship and career education programs in primary and secondary schools? Do they exist? Are they sufficient? Um, uh, again, I'm not sure we are best positioned uh, to respond to that um, because it's not generally conversations that we have directly with, uh, with teachers. From from what we have experienced and learned over the last uh, two years is there are in various countries a number of different programs that are being introduced. Um, Karen touched on the next generation science standards uh, out in the US. Uh, we have here in the UK Gatsby benchmarking. Um, so I think to a large degree um, the, the education programs or the education mandates are there. Um, the feedback that we've had from many teachers is in many instances they're actually not aware or fully aware of what these mandates are and beyond that they are not quite sure how to actually fulfill these mandates and a prime example of that would be the Gatsby benchmarks. These were rolled out approximately two years ago here in the UK. We are still speaking and hearing from teachers who haven't heard of the Gatsby benchmarks yet. Um, so and, and of course, from school to school, from region to region, from country to country, uh, there will be differences and changes. Um, I think our personal viewpoint, uh, the Futurum uh, viewpoint is 
there isn't enough being done and there aren't enough concrete links between career guidance and the actual careers market, the job market, uh, commerce, industry, uh, and of course, further in higher education, which is you know, the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Um, our final question for today. Do you think that students can contextualize STEM subject and not only link them with STEM careers to a satisfying degree? For example, do they realize they need design skills and high competence in mathematics in order to become architects? Uh, again, I think this is the challenge that we are aiming to, to address because we know, uh, you know students are, are not thinking as broadly as that. Uh, we know that students are simply not at an age where they're going out seeking that kind of information. Uh, the focus groups that we've run all suggest that parents and teachers are still the go-to people when it comes to career advice and guidance. And a lot of the career advice is about contextualizing STEM learning. A prime example of this was um, we had feedback from a, a, a head teacher at a school that we work with here in the UK. Uh, it's an all girls school in a very affluent uh, area. Uh, they had an induction evening for the grade 10 girls uh, and there were about 300 plus parents in attendance. Um, and those parents were all asked to uh, provide, uh, just to write down on a piece of paper, the career or the job they saw for their, in their child's future. Out of more than 300 parents, there were only eight different careers or jobs listed. And you could probably imagine or guess what they are. Doctor, lawyer, engineer, nurse, fireman. And the interesting thing, when we started, uh, you know, when we start thinking about the role of an engineer, and I started speaking to parents and people that I know, and I asked them, what, what, in your mind, what does an engineer do? The fallback position more often than not is they build bridges, they build roads, and they build infrastructure. So the connections to bioengineering, electrical engineering, and a whole host of other engineering career op options are missed. Um, so part of our role is educating parents, giving them high quality information that allows them to steer their children in a myriad of different uh, directions. Uh, and similarly to provide teachers with that kind of uh, insight uh, as well. Um, and the hope is, as Erica touched on through the way in which uh, our content is developed and created, um, that we'll be able to make that connection. So students see the connections between the subjects that they are having to choose and commit to for the, their, their high school careers and potentially what those subjects can lead to in terms of ultimately a job, a career for them. Thank you very much for addressing this question, Brett. Um, I would like to ask our participants if they have any additional questions or comments for our presenters. In the meantime, my colleague Katerina has shared the link in the Q&A chat box uh, of our survey uh, of our feedback form. Please complete this very brief survey in order to uh, receive a certificate of attendance. Many thanks to you now and everyone for being here. <laughs> then I guess we can wrap up this webinar. Uh, Karen, Erika, Brett, thank you so much for your contribution and your presentation. Many thanks to my colleague Katerina and to all our participants. Thank you, Eleni, and thank you for the opportunity. We love working with uh, Scientex. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your interest and your support. Okay, we can wrap up now. Um, have a nice evening.